Salvation is not earned, and that's something that's a gift of God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Weekend Edition. It is great to have you with us as we go through the Bible. And one of the things that we do is talk about uh, this particular passage, Colossians chapter 1 to 4. And that's interesting. We're going to be dealing with that today. Ryan, what are you doing? Well, today I'm talking about the Big Bang's Big Three. All right, the big three and the big bang. Very interesting. Okay, <laughs> now you study. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Well, from Colossians 2, we're going to talk about digging deeper to find the truth. All right, very good. Colossians is when we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. There is great wisdom and there is great knowledge. The question is, how do we find it? Well, we're going to be finding out that and more as we continue to study on. So get your Bible and get your Bible guide as we do this and turn to today's passage because it is a good one. The New Testament reveals a lot about the personality of the Apostle Paul. It does this in the book of Acts that records his conversion, his missionary journeys, and some of his teachings, and of course, by the books of the New Testament written by him. These books of his were originally written as letters to the specific audiences that he knew personally, and some of them were actually written while he was imprisoned for his faith. The Apostle Paul continued his work even while he was imprisoned for his faith. Several of his New Testament letters were written from prison, while the specific time or place of imprisonment is not mentioned in the letters. The fact that Paul was writing from prison is mentioned, and there are several factors that can be added together to create a sort of loose timeline for the writing of the books. Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians have traditionally been seen as coming from Paul's Roman imprisonment, written about in the end chapters of Acts. Furthermore, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians appear to have all been written in the same period of time. Ephesians and Colossians are linked by the mention of Titius as their letter carrier. Colossians and Philemon are linked by Paul's list of five companions, the same in both letters. Furthermore, greetings are sent in both Philemon and Colossians to a certain Archippus, a member of Philemon's household, leading to the conclusion that Philemon was from Colossae. With Ephesus being the closest major city center to Colossae, it would have made a lot of sense for Paul to send these three letters by the same letter carrier, Titius. The book of Philippians is traditionally seen as also being written from Paul's Roman imprisonment described in Acts, due to the mention of the Praetorian Guard and of Caesar's household. Philippians is also dated after the writing of Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians, due to the more somber tone adopted by Paul when referring to his incarceration. This tone may have been caused by the sheer amount of time that his case had gone without being dealt with by the authorities in Rome. The majority of Christian tradition informs us that Paul was eventually released from this first Roman imprisonment. The book of 2 Timothy then is attributed to a second Roman imprisonment of Paul during the persecution of Christians by Emperor Nero, the imprisonment that would eventually claim Paul's life.
Paul confronted the people at Coloss with the reality of growing in Christ. Now, he never visited the church, but he knew that they would be tempted, like all the other churches, with the reality of strange teaching. It was a splendid example that many Greeks in Colossus believed humans could earn their salvation if they paid attention to God's ways. They said Jesus Christ was a higher being who rose above our lowly temptations and our desires. And then they would spin all kinds of untruth. But the truth is that God became man and man was God in Jesus Christ. Satan seems so innocent, but in the end he is terribly crooked. And the book of Colossians is about what we believe and how we serve God. Colossians 2 verses 1 through 10. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As we continue to go through the Bible, we are in the New Testament. This is exciting because we're going through a lot of books quickly. And uh, as we do that, we land in these areas that we can learn from, that God speaks to us from. And we're in one of those areas today, right now. And I want to encourage you that if you have your Bible guide, turn to today's passage. If you don't, why not? Write to us. Uh, you can use any of the addresses on the bottom of the screen or www.biblediscoverytv.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you do that, click on Donate, make a donation, and write in the little comments line, send me a Bible guide. We'll do that, but also it'll take you to the PDF files too. So it's very important, very important. We sure could use your help right now. That would be great. Anyway, I want to tell you about today's passage because this is really good. We are in Colossians. Now, this is an amazing book to an amazing city, which Paul never visited, all right? Salvation is not earned. So many people think that living for God and being in the church is earning. No, it's not earning. It's a result of what God did for you. And you're trying to uh, give him your life. That's important. We read Colossians 1 to 4. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us. Help us to see this. Help us to get it. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we would hear you today and may it change people in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at this and we go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. It says, for I want you to know what a great conflict, Paul says, I have for you and those in Laodicea. That was just down the road. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden 
all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wait a minute. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Absolutely. Paul says, when we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord, there is great wisdom and eternal knowledge. We soon discover this when we hear his word. As a matter of fact, the Lord says in the book of Proverbs, he says, I have, the, I have wisdom for you. Now, think about this. If you know God, God's made it possible for you to know him, and he is the one who created everything, and he says, I've got wisdom for you, wouldn't you want, you know, some help, some of that wisdom? Well, God's going to give it to you. When you trust the Lord, when you make him Lord of your life, the Lord's going to give you that wisdom. That's exciting. That's what Colossians tells us. That's what Paul said. Now, as we think that through, let's go on to the next scripture, because this is Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7, which says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with pervasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. What in the world is Paul saying? We must hear the word of God. This is very important. We must hear the word of God, the Bible, not the words of man, books. Jesus Christ speaks to us in the Bible about what he did and about how we become saved. We must hear it. Beloved, I, I, I will just say to you what the book says, Ecclesiastes, of the writing of books, there will be no end written back in 1000 BC or close to it. You're talking about, man, this book's 3000 years old. And, and he, even he said of the writing of books, there'll be no end. He knew and understood what it was God did that we would be doing. And we write more books today than ever before. But the Bible is still the chief number one book. It's the most published and it's the most distributed. 1.7 billion. That's how many Bibles the Gideons have distributed as of a date 10 years ago. 1.7 billion Bibles. Can you believe that? Absolutely. That's amazing. Colossians chapter two, verses eight through 10 say, verse eight, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men. That's important. According to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Here again, Paul says it again. We must remember that philosophy is primarily a compilation of ideas, but listening to God is the simplest and easiest way to understand about humans and about him, about God. Now listen to me carefully, beloved. Very important. I know everybody wants to study and go to school and educate themselves and hear, 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 and just be so smart at the end of time. At the end of your life, you'll be smart. You have PhDs and 3HDs and 4HDs and 5HDs. Let me tell you something. You can be as smart as any person, but you get older and dementia starts to get in and you lose it all. But remember this, if you know Jesus Christ, if you know the Lord, doesn't matter with dementia or anything else, God has preserved your spirit. You know and you understand. See, a lot of people don't get it. Education is not the key to life. The key to life is knowing the truth about why you're living, who made you and where you're going. Do you know where you're going when you pass away? Do you know what's happening to you when you leave this life? A lot of people say, well, I think I'm going somewhere off in the distant universe. No, you're going either to heaven or hell. That's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. And the Bible is very clear about this. And I want to tell you something, you can go to heaven. 
Jesus Christ made a way for us. He came 2,000 years ago and he died on the cross. He was born of a virgin, Mary. He died on the cross. And then after we killed him three days, miraculously, suddenly he rose from the dead. Nobody helped him do that. And he showed up, seen over 500 people at the time. And, and he said, I am here. He said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden with religion and all this stuff, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. Come to me and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus. Pray to him today and say, Lord, be Lord of my life right now. We're coming down to the end and we'll talk about Revelation in a few weeks, but this is interesting because next time on Quick Study Television, we zero in more on the Timothy and all of that. It's very, very good. So stay there and make time for us. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, you know, the Big Bang Theory is the standard cosmology of today's world. It's true. Most scientists today believe that the Big Bang is the correct scenario of the origin of the universe. And when one asks these astrophysicists why they believe that it is the correct cosmology, they usually put forward three big proofs. First, the expansion of the universe. Second, the abundances of the light elements. And third, the cosmic background radiation. But are these good proofs of the Big Bang Theory? Let's study. The name Hubble is synonymous with modern astronomy. There is the Hubble telescope, the Hubble constant, the Hubble length and diagram, and also the Hubble law. These are all named after the 20th century American astronomer Edwin Powell Hubble. And it was he who first promoted the idea of an expanding universe. Today this is almost unanimously accepted by both creationists and evolutionists alike. In fact, evolutionists often use the expanding universe as one of the major proofs for the Big Bang Theory. However, this is backwards, since universal expansion was already known about before the development of the Big Bang. Indeed, the Big Bang was constructed around the expansion and therefore explains it, but does not predict it. However, many different models could be constructed to explain universal expansion besides the Big Bang. The steady state model is one example of this. From a creationist point of view, there are a couple of different interpretations of universal expansion. Some interpret the passage in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, as a reference to universal expansion. It says that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. However, a closer examination of the original Hebrew reveals that the Bible seems to be presenting this statement in the past tense and not the present. How then could this be interpreted? Could it be that the Bible is referring to a stretching out of the heavens during the creation week? If this is the case, it provides an interesting solution for the light travel time problem. The light travel time problem is this. If the universe is only thousands of years old, as a plain reading of scripture indicates, then how are we seeing light from stars, galaxies, and other objects many hundreds of thousands of light years away? Indeed, light from these distant objects would take much longer than thousands of years to reach the Earth. Over the years, there have been a number of credible theories about getting the distant light to the Earth in a short amount of time. However, if God did stretch out the heavens during the creation week, then the light from stars and galaxies would have stretched out as well. This would mean the light was already visible by the time God created man. 
Therefore, one of the ways a creationist could interpret universal expansion is to consider the possibility that God created the universe in an expanding mode. This is actually a very good design feature, since if the universe were static, gravity would slowly pull the universe inward, causing a universal collapse, referred to by some as the Big Crunch. God is supremely wise and intelligent, and we would do well to pay attention to His Word. So to review, universal expansion cannot be used as a proof for the Big Bang because universal expansion was already known about before the model was ever developed. Therefore, the Big Bang explains the universal expansion, but it doesn't predict it. And as I said, any number of models could be developed to explain the expansion. So the Big Bang is actually unnecessary. And next weekend, we'll look at the other two proofs for the Big Bang Theory. You know, that's interesting, Ryan. As I think this through, there, there's a couple of problems with the Big Bang, and it's, a, it's a, a way that people figure the universe came into existence without any divine uh, assistance, if you would. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is there was absolutely nothing, and then it exploded. Well, what exploded? Something has to explode. But there was nothing. But something has to explode. So that's the real problem here. The yeah. problem goes back to that is who did the Big Bang? Who started the Big Bang? Right. And I heard some people explain to me, they said, well, the Big Bang just re repeats itself over and over again. I said, well, that's great, but who started the it's cycles? Still no first cause. Exactly. But, yeah. Who's the yeah. first cause? Like, what happened? Where is the first cause? And so even they explain and they say, well, we can't know for sure and all of that, but yeah. they'll a, never yeah. come to the place where they admit that God is the first beginner. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the end of the story for people who believe in the Bible. Lord, turn their hearts of stone into mm -hmm. hearts of flesh. Amen. I mean, you know, and, and yeah. you just, uh, you just gotta say that because mm -hmm. that's important to understand. And, you know, I, I, was, I used to be somebody who, was uh, believed in that, and then I, the Lord really challenged me, and I read his Bible, nobody helped me, but I checked out a few people. And then I became a progressive creationist, with God used a lot of time and death and everything to get things going, and one day somebody asked me a question, they said, well, how can God use death to create life? And I thought about it, because I always thought of the, the crucifixion and his resurrection, I thought of that as the answer, but then I thought about it, because the wages of sin is death, mm -hmm. but the gift of God is eternal life. So wait a minute, God did not create death and, and cancer and all that stuff that we see in the fossil record. Yeah. So something had to happen. So that brought me to the place where this is yeah. what I believe now. Yeah. And I've looked at it many different ways and I've talked to many scientists and they came to the same conclusion. So, but it's interesting. Very, very interesting. It Thank really you so is. much. For and me. you're not the only one. There are hundreds of thousands of people who have different beliefs as well and who have challenged things that they have heard believers in God say or challenged the Word of God and have actually come to the place in their life when they've had to, to admit that they were wrong, that their thinking was wrong, and, uh, and they've come to repentance before the Lord God. And the Bible is eternal word, mm -hmm. so that didn't really come from here. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what John says. So we begin to understand that and we realize, wait a minute, we look at images and visions mm -hmm. of heaven mm -hmm. and we see the Bible or the words, the text revealed there. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, wait a minute, this thing is bigger than I thought. Mm -hmm. And there is a book that is eternal, and that is the Word That's of God, the 66 one. books. Yep. If people only realize that that dusty book on their shelf was the book of life, was the answer yes. to their questions, you know but, what I mean? And yeah, it's, 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 they would read it. It's unfortunate that, that so many Bibles just sit on the shelf mm -hmm. and get, get dusty. It's, it's the book of life, you know? Pick it up, open it up, dust it off, and just give it a try. Absolutely. 
And that's exactly where I was going with uh, my segment today. We're talking about digging deep when looking for truth in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians 2 verses 1 and 3, it says 1 to 3, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, Paul is telling the church at Colossus and believers here today that Christ is the only source that's required for wisdom and for knowledge. We don't need to look to any other philosophy to find that. Now, the word hidden in verse 3 doesn't mean secretive, but it plays on the word treasures. So Jewish writers often will use this kind of imagery to encourage seekers to dig deep when looking for the truth. And that's exactly what we do here. Mm. We, we want to dig deeper into the word because it's so multidimensional. It's so much more than even just the surface words that we read. We really do believe that as we read the word of God, there's healing for our minds, for our souls, for, for our, our, yeah, real, our, our beings. beings. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I love when I read my Bible to read out loud. I love to just fill the air with the word of God. I, I, I find that it even changes the atmosphere around me. It and, um, does. In fact, I know some people who uh, believe, and you've seen the experiments they've done with audio and sand. They put sand and they, mm. they put tones and they broadcast music and everything else. It really is interesting what, they, what the sand what does the sand, on yes. that. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah. So that tells you that, you know, if you... If you check this out and if you do it, the sound does change the way things are. So when God's word is read, and that's why we do it on TV, that's why we do it right here on Quick Study Television. When God's word is read, it changes the environment. It does. It changes things. Not because of God's word. That's right. That's why it is. Not because of anything we do, but because of God's word. You do a great job at reading the Bible, by the way, on the program. It's excellent. Well, it, it's, it's a pleasure for me. I mean, I, it's something that I thoroughly enjoy. So. I, I remember when, when uh, we were going to do that, and uh, we said, why would we read the Bible? Exactly, yeah. I was the <laughs> biggest, I was like, why, why would we do that? And that was back in the 90s, and my dad said, well, I want to read the Bible. And that was fascinating, yeah. because we didn't think it was a good idea at first. And then we started getting letters. People were getting healed. Yeah. We couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Things were happening when the Bible was read. It was amazing. Yeah. Speaking of reading the Bible, this is a way to enhance your personal study. Part two of Unlocking the Bible is a DVD that we put together. Very excited about it. How many verses are in the Bible? How many chapters are in the Bible? I mean, how many questions are in the Bible? Who in the world would know that? Well, we put that on here to talk about it so that you can learn how to understand the Bible. Very simple stuff. You go deeper. You dig deeper into the Word of God. So get yours for $25 or more. You can write to us, Unlocking the Bible.